Really? Okay, yeah. I saw, I think it was Miami University. No, sorry. Boston University or Boston College was starting to flirt with the idea of starting their school semester in January. The question is, if they do that, you know, will they try to keep football separate? You know, but how would that work with no classes? You know, there's a lot of stuff I think needs to be figured out. Um, what I was thinking about personally is, you know, baseball had made the comment, comments that they were going to try to sequester everybody to Arizona since they have all those stadiums there and then kind of basically keep them quarantined, test them before the games, throw them into the games and do whatever and have a season. If that was to go off without a hitch, I think that would definitely save football because they could just do the same thing for football. I mean, why not? College or pro? I'm sorry, uh, professional baseball. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's an idea. I just, at a certain point, what about the, the health risk to the players, though? Nobody's really talking about that. The only thing I start to think about is as time goes on and people are kind of, if they're truly, and I, you would hope that a professional athlete is probably taking the stay-at-home order a little bit more seriously because they have the means to not have to really have to go out, right? So now you've got a month, two months, three months um, going into the summer, and they say, all right, guys, we're going to have you guys all come to this area. We're going to test everybody and watch it. If you guys, you guys are all, everyone's negative, we can throw you out for the game. And they just keep you guys sequestered like that. Now people won't be able to get to see their families. So that's going to get a little bit long. Uh, but, you know, maybe they do that already. I was thinking about that for the NBA playoffs, too. Now these guys all been... Basketball camp? <laughs> Send them somewhere to, like, Vegas or... Like, yep, and just lock them up. Because basketball, they've been, you know, they've been off for a while. Has anyone even... I haven't heard that at all in the news. Have they even talked about trying to figure out how to do the finals? The only thing I heard was that some of the Asian leagues were thinking about starting back up in another month or two as far as pro basketball, but as far as the NBA. And then again, like we talked about on that group phone call, the Notre Dame phone call the other day, who makes the call? Who makes the call? So it's got to be – UFC tried to do it, and then they and someone called and, and – and, uh, what's the guy for UFC? I always want to say Joe Rogan, but that's not him. It's the other guy. What's his name? UFC is, UFC is on my Dana White. Dana White. Dana White's the guy who said he was going to do it. He was going to have UFC with no fans. He was going to test everybody. Again, you're talking about small numbers, right? You got, what, four or five fighters on each side. So, like, ten fighters for the whole night. The ref. You can actually do that. If well, someone... something interesting that I, I happened to see the other day was, uh, of course, you know, I never own up to actually watching anything. TV just happens to be stuck on it. So, Monday Night Raw came on on, US, on USA Network. Wrestling? Do they actually do that? Is that where they have um, tight end? What's his name? Uh, the, the, the Patriots tight end? Did he go on that day? I have no idea. I have no idea. It was two women. That's why I was watching. Okay. That's what but, um, Fair and, enough. Um, they had basically the wrestlers would come on and give like this Shakespearean speech before, you know, over, you know, dramatizing the whole battle between them and the person they're supposed to wrestle. And then they had two wrestlers going at it. They had like their girlfriends. You know, who were other wrestlers on the, you know, outside the uh, ropes, and they had a ref. But it was just weird because I've never seen UFC where there's no fans. Like, it's usually stadium status, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. But it's kind of strange because the rest of the arena, it was the normal arena, but it was just dark. And it so, was kind of anticlimactic and quiet, and it was just like, I was like, okay, wrestling's weird enough, but this is weird. Now, if we never get out of this thing and start doing the no fans, there's going to be a few archived games in 20 years going to uh Go back and look at. I think it was the big, um, the ACC. I think they started their tournament and stopped it, and they had it televised. They had no fans, but they had canned uh, cheering. So if someone hit a three, you'd hear cheers. And I'm like, yeah. wait a minute, there's no fans. But you know, it you don't really notice the fans sometimes if they don't do a cutover. The stage was a tight shot. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. After a while, the. <sighs> but they played that. They put some of that in there. There was somebody in production that said, "All right, now hold on." We gotta have somebody cheer for that three, otherwise it's just dead. So they no, they had some, some some noise that went on. That was hilarious. I mean, theoretically, the the guys on the bench and you know the training staff could have been the ones making the noise, but in my opinion, I think it was uh, some definite can can, can cheering. Because you watching any late night TV? Do you ever watch like uh, I don't even know the Seth Meyer and those guys? Uh, well, it depends on what like what show it is. I'm not. I don't know all of them. There's like Seth Meyer and uh, the guy that has the roots on there. What's his name? Oh, you mean like Jimmy Kimmel? Yeah, Jimmy Kimmel. All those. Are... 
yeah, yeah. If you watch their shows now, it's so horrible because, you know, they do these cheesy jokes, right? But they get laughter. So you're like, ah. Now they're doing them in their living room. They're reading the card, the jokes, and there's zero response. It's so awkward. It's like in, in business, sometimes we'll, uh, you'll do a conference call. And, you know, me, I always have a joke. Well, everyone, when, you, when it's time, your turn to talk, everyone goes mute. So you'll say a joke, and it's dead air. People can be dying laughing back at home. But you hear that dead air, and it's just so incomplete that <laughs> you can't you can't really handle it. You're like, oh my god, that was. We don't even realize how much ambiance crowd noise adds to stuff until you don't watch, you know, until you don't hear it. It's right. So much part of how we're conditioned, like you know, there's a big play in a football game, you're waiting for that. For Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Or, you know, these talk shows, even if it's a corny joke, you hear. <laughs> now yeah. it's just. I don't know. It's we're in a weird place, that's for sure. Yeah, you gotta have it. You can't let those things die. And no, and if you sit in the audience for those things, you know they had those. Remember those uh, lights and say applause. We went to um, what's my man? I, I'm losing things. Uh, Steve Harvey show. We were on the Steve Harvey show, and they were like, they coached us like, okay, when we do this, you go nuts. Everyone cheers loud. No, that's not good enough. And they had us cheer loud, cheer loud because. If we ever, if he ever made a joke that didn't hit, I guarantee that they would cut to the a crowd of us cheering really loud in the stands. Or well, you, your buddy, that's what your buddy did in uh, Hollywood for a while, Owen. Yeah, his job was to warm up the crowd like before shows formally, like a so fluffer. Jokes, <laughs> and he coaches guys on. All right, this is how I want you to laugh when a joke comes. Corny as hell, but it is. It is, but you it, you don't realize it. Even if you watch a movie, like a scary movie, what no one really thinks about is the score, right? The oh, I, oh, I, yeah, I, you pay attention to it, but if you don't have that, that thing gets you, you know, starts to work you up. That music starts to get your, your shoulders get a little tight. You start worrying. If they take that away, it's just a doofus person walking around the corner that you know somebody's going to be at, you know? Well, I literally do that because a lot of times, even on the score, it's not actual music. Mm-hmm. It's just notes. It's tone. Yeah. And it's like, it's like an orchestra. And I'm like, they're tensing the music up. So I'm not going to get tense because I know something's coming. You yeah. know, it's just the tone of, but it's amazing how that how that basically affects your mood. And Absolutely. Like, it's a weird place. I mean, television and entertainment is going to be weird for a while. It is. I, I, I think for the morale of this country, though, it would be nice to do it. I know that, you know, people are going to, non sports fans are going to consider it to be shallow. But if you think about it, after the Boston Marathon, you know, the first thing you wanted to do is, you know, go to a Boston baseball game and say, hey, you know, this terrorists aren't going to take baseball from us. After 9-11, trying to get back to sports and playing, trying to get back to some sort of normalcy. Um, you know, people have a different view of it. But sports are such a part of the fabric of our country. Really, every country, for that matter, maybe not the same level as we are here, but it's a fabric of it. Otherwise, you're just working, eating, and going to sleep, right? Going to school, eating, and going to sleep. You got to have some sort of a you know, thing to get you, to move you emotionally. And I think sports is that is that thing. So um, from a money standpoint, yeah, there won't be people going to the games and the local economies will suffer, but the ratings will be out of the world, out of this world. You know, Michael Jordan's show oh, starts cool. Friday. We're never going to, everyone's going to watch that. That's going to have like 100% viewership. What's that? That Michael Jordan, like the last call or last dance oh, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It comes Friday. Dance. Yeah, I mean, I can't wait for the week to be over so I can watch that and the, the ratings will be higher than the Super Bowl. For a month. As a matter of fact, about a month ago, my son was like, hey, LeBron and someone else was online, another NBA player, talking about they should move it up because it was originally scheduled for the 18th. And, you know, you could have gotten, like you said, that's going to be one of the most highest. It's going to have Super Bowl numbers. Absolutely. Numbers. Every every episode. I think it's like 10 episodes. It was supposed to be in June. I think they probably had it for after the NBA Finals, right? And now they moved right. it up. I don't know what they're waiting for. Like, what? What are you? What did you have to reschedule? What's the rerun of the of the the Rose Bowl from 2010? You know? I don't know. I think it's it probably a monetary thing. You know, they so many sponsors bought so much time because that's what basically you get know, rid of all these, shit. How much commercial time they could sell? That's so a great. They probably point. Out and they just didn't want to change. You know, yeah. Friday night. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if they since they put since they publicized that date. You know, all these um, advertisers were, were, you know, they already did it under contract, so they probably couldn't change it. But, it, I mean, it's going to be, they're going to rewrite it like 200 times. Because think about, we're, we're talking about sports in the future, the financial future. What ESPN going to do? they got to be losing money because they've got to be losing viewers. There's nothing to watch. You know, the funny thing you say that, though, is like, okay, 
I find myself still cutting the ESPN and giving them a shot and seeing what's going on there. And whatever content that they're showing, they're not paying for. So I wonder if, they're, if there's some break even. I know advertising dollars, they probably are dying with that. That has to be right. They, they can't be. Who's buying ad space right now at a premium when you should be doing the NBA finals hey, or baseball? Have you ever seen ESPN show a soccer video game? Like guys competing, uh, playing FIFA? Have you ever seen that? Uh, I I no I have I I have seen some no I haven't seen that specifically I think I have seen some video game like cutovers but never really paid attention to it I bet that's killing right now. Was competitors in playing FIFA, but I thought it was you know when I first kind of tuned into it I was like it was a soccer match and no it was dudes playing the video game that's how good the graphics are now. Oh yeah, right. And watched. And can you imagine if you were an advertiser and you paid. Hundred thousand dollars, a couple hundred thousand dollars for a couple of spots, and it had to be televised during kids competing in FIFA soccer. It's hey, really getting that. they give scholarships now. They give scholarships for video games now. So there's a there's a real audience. I talked to uh, our buddy Emmett today, and he was like, I had to wake up and get a little maddened before work. I mean, people really care about the video games. I've never been that good at it, so I got into it a little bit in college and high school, but I never really stayed with it. And my kids aren't in it, but. There's so many people out there who, you know, they can't get enough of it. So, so speaking of, uh, you know, pandemic prognostications, uh, the other day when we were listening to our classmate, Dr. Eric Griggs, and his somewhat doomsday prediction, what do you think about that? Because one of the things that he did say when he was talking about pandemic numbers, and he said that it was going to spike before it got better, and he said that um, basically... We're going to have to ride this out at least to December, and we could lose over a million people in the population. I mean, did, did that strike a chord with you, or were you just like, yeah, it's just numbers like anybody else? Because if it's a million people, it's going to be somebody you know, and I know. Hopefully we won't be oh, it's them. already been a couple people that we know. I think, you know, had it been had it been someone else saying it, I probably would have shrugged it off a little bit. I think the part that really stuck home is that he's on the front lines and he's seeing it every single day. Um, I asked him a lot of questions that I had been wondering about, and he answered them all perfectly for for correctness, but the worst case scenario. So I asked him if there's multiple strains. He said that there's four strains. And I, that, I was wondering, like, why is it sometimes deadly and why is it asymptomatic? What they don't know is, and, you know, I heard about it in, North or South Korea or something, there's like 50 cases of people getting it twice. I wonder if they had one strain and got the other strain. I can't really make any sense about it. But then in the U.S., I've heard people say that, you know, hey, once you get it, maybe they'll have uh, Dr. Fossey, I think what his name is, the guy that, that speaks with um, the country. I think they said that they would test you for the antibody and then give you an immunity card to say that you could go back to work. They're doing that in some countries. They're thinking about doing it. But who knows if that's there. So... I do think, you know, like today it snowed in Chicago, right? So as much as that sucks to have snow in April, part of me was like, good, man. Maybe people stay inside because it was getting a little bit too nice out. As people started to get a little too relaxed, 70, 80 degrees. I worry that when the numbers start to go down and, you know, if, if you go until the end of this month, into mid next month, and you don't really know anybody who's been suffering from it, who's done it, and then they start to say that the numbers are going down. Say, oh, cool, cool, let's go. Let's run outside. It's nice. Let's barbecue. Let's have a couple people over. A small party. We'll do this. And then it'll blow back up, you know. I just want this thing gone because, you know, you and I are both at risk being African-American and, you know, don't have the health of an 18-year-old person. So I'm very nervous about this thing flaring up and lingering. Um, I don't know how I feel about the the first round of, of – uh, immunizations that have come out, though. I kind of feel like that needs to be tested a little bit. I'm scared that, that you know, if they're going to rush that thing out there, it might give you rickets or something like that. Yeah, I'm still looking at America sideways after the Tuskegee experiment, so you never know. I won't Here's be the thing. first in line. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not going to be like a, like a, what was it, not Vincent Barty, you said, I'm not going to be the first, but I ain't going to be the third. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not first, you're last. Here's a question. When you were talking about people's dedication to doing the right thing. I've heard some crazy rumors out there, and I got a buddy in Arizona, and he was telling me that people, you know, people do foolish stuff. And he's talking about in grocery stores, people were licking food just to be foolish. I mean... <laughs> well, I saw that on the internet. There was a thing. Are you talking about post-corona or, like, in the past? Post-corona, yeah. Because there was an internet sensation where, like, girls, girls were picking, ah, lick the ice cream and put it back. 
and that's where there's a, there's a video. This right now, I wish you could cut the videos. There's a video of how they treat people in India who are breaking the quarantine. Have I if I shared that with you before? So li- literally, there's there's cops in India. They catch you riding the bike. They have these bamboo sticks and they oh, beat you. They just and they they don't just beat you until you agree to turn around. While you try to turn around and you're trying to comply, they're giving you more and more and more. And they're videotaping it and they're releasing it. I saw one in Mexico where they had a guy handcuffed on the back of a truck. This was way overboard. And they had a full baseball bat and they had his pants pulled down like a child. And they are hitting him. And you're just watching the flesh. You the think thing. that wasn't just Mexican justice? or, or? Uh, Just hey, go home, man. We said go home, go home. And sometimes I think you need that. So when you see somebody in a store and they lick an ice cream, I don't care about your rights. I don't care if they're black, white, female, or whatever. I wish they could just blow the whistle and get the Indian dude from the back to come out and beat them with the cane. Because sometimes you just need to be physically harmed to stop you from doing stupid shit. And and that's and that's the one thing that I'm saying. Like, I, when the weather gets nice, you're not going to stop people from going outside. You know, I, I guess Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, had a commercial where she was saying like, "Stay in the crib because your jumper's still broke." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My neighbors, my neighbors. You know, I don't know what they're thinking, but their kids play all day outside, all day like nothing's going on. And I don't think it's going to be until it starts hitting home, as Dr. Griggs was saying, that people are going to start really, really taking it seriously. You know, playing outside and kind of riding the bikes and stuff like that, and trying to stay within your family, I think, you know, is kind of minimalized. You know, there's not really well, much. That's of a... how it starts, is what I'm saying. You're right. That's how it starts. And then he goes, there was a Florida, uh, a video that they, they said Florida, New Orleans, I don't know. There had to be 2,000 kids, not in school, just hanging out in, a, like, an apartment area, like one of those, uh, you know, com- complex deals, you know, like a low-rise complex thing. And they're everywhere. And if I was the cops, they are getting out there telling people to leave. I'm not getting out of the car for nothing. I'm going to sit there in my car, blow the horn, maybe let the dog out, you know, maybe muzzle them up, just let them terrorize and go home. But if people aren't going to go home, they're going to blame later, and someone's going to die. And I mean, you got to get, you got to stay in the house. I mean, you you got to, you can go out and do your little thing, but just you got to stay from being around people. They had the spring breakers went to Flo- to uh, South Beach. They were all kicked it. Florida, they didn't close the beaches. You know, they didn't want to give up the revenue. They came down there. They all flew back, and a bunch of those kids died. Right? These kids are not supposed to be in the high risk group, but a bunch of those kids died. But if you take a hundred kids. Somebody in there has diabetes or blood pressure problems or asthma that doesn't know it or, you know, and mm-hmm. they got it and a bunch of them died because they don't know better. You have to do it. And we're so free in this country. And obviously, you know, I don't want to go too deep, but, you know, it's great that we're free. But sometimes, you know, we everyone wants a smaller government. They don't want to be told what to do. But sometimes you need to a big brother to come in here and be like, get in your house and do what you got to go do. Because we just think, well, I'll do it. Everyone else can stay home. I'm just going to, what I have to do is so important. I have to leave or it's no big deal. And then people die. People and that didn't take the risk die. Guy now in, in times of emergency like this? Say it again? Are you a government regulation guy? Uh-huh. In times like this, man, sometimes I think there's things that we're not supposed to know. I, I think, you know, you know, Trump does a horrible job when he's communicating, when he's online. But I think sometimes, I don't say you should be lied to. But, you know, the famous line, you can't handle the truth. I don't think we can all handle the truth of what's going on. So, like, what Dr. Griggs was telling us the other day, I don't really think that, you know, some people might say, well, how come we're not hearing that? I don't know if we can handle that, man. That that doomsday thing there, they have to do it little by little. They have to keep extending it because right now it's still the end of May that we're going to be quarantined. Okay, they probably know right now that it's going to be the end of June, but don't tell me right now. Don't tell me until the first week of May because Maybe the second week of May, you know what? We're going to have to do another month because then it's just another month. You know what I mean? What do they say when we worked out? Somebody's like, oh, no, we just get you know, one more sprint. Oh, no, just give me two more reps. You give those two reps all you can. Okay, just one more. Okay, let's go. Look, if someone said, hey, man, listen, we got about 45 more reps, you're going to faint. <laughs> you're not going to make it. Right, 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 right. So I think you trickle that information out. How long do you think America can put up with the constant rescheduling before things start getting a little nuts? You know, I think as long as they as the as the government is providing, um, and I'm not trying to, say, you know, I'm not a big socialist guy here, but like as long as you got some stimulus money coming in and people aren't starving, um, I think that people we can we can handle it, we can take it. I think when people start doing without and they don't, they can't eat, or you know, I what I really start to worry about is, you know, we haven't heard any really large numbers being reported about these, you know, hourly workers at the stores getting sick and dying, people that. You know, work at Mariano's, a big outbreak where 
you know, 20 people at, Mar- at work at Mariano's get sick and die or something like that. When that happens, I think we're going to have a little panic and we're not going to have people to do it. I'll be honest. If my son or daughter works in the grocery store right now, you know, Zach, you say he was working at, at Jewel for a while. Would, would you allow him to go to Jewel right now and be working or would you tell him to stay home? Well, okay, so my sister and mother campaign for him not to, and he does not want to work. So um, it's a judgment call. I mean, and it sounds a little selfish, but I wouldn't want him to expose himself, thus exposing me. Okay. Uh, Whatever the reason is, I'm not sending my kids to work. If my son worked in a store right now, I quit. He quits. You know, we have the luxury, though, that we don't need the money. Um, You know, obviously the money's good. I'm not saying we're rich, but we can survive without a child's labor, but I'm not allowing my kid to go to a store and, and risk his life. I feel terrible when I go to a store and I see there's a little old lady that works at, at, uh, at Mariano's and I know her from the gym. She's got like all her kids wants to know her name or whatever. So she loves me. We see each other. She's, she's at least 106 years old, maybe 107. And I'm like, what are you doing here? She's like, well, you know, I'm like, God, go, are she still paying off the Notre Dame education? I mean, go home. You have every risk factor. I mean, you're, you don't have that many years left anyway. Right. Go home, man. It's a hell of a way to look at it if that's your grandma. <laughs> yeah, but don't waste them in here with me. Shit. Right. If I had to do Instacart and wait, I could figure out. There's enough stuff in my freezer, in my in my pantry right now. And I'm not just saying me. But, you know, we can make do a lot better than we're making do. You know what I mean? We're not well, going in the World War II phase of rations and stuff. A friend of mine always says uh, in the movie The Book of Eli, where he, he goes and he right. says... You know, I think a kid asked what it was like back in the day before the nuclear holocaust or whatever the pro- the premise of the movie was. And uh, Denzel Washington's character says people had more than they needed. And I think that's what we're finding out. But if you think about it, like economically, there's going to be a bunch of strains also, too, because you're a property owner. I'm a property owner. Are your tenants flaking out on their rent or their mortgages because, you know, because of this? I have this, to. You know, Two properties. We have three. We have three. I manage two. My wife manages one. Her her tenant paid the rent. She's in retail, but again, she get they got the little stimulus, right? So that's about in Chicago. That's about a month's rent. That little stimulus going. If they do lose their job and they're unemployed, then you can get the you know I think it's like a thousand dollars. Well, if you max it out, it's like a thousand or eleven hundred dollars a week, which is higher than normal. So so far, you know, my tenant, she's a nanny. She's paid the one month. Uh, I don't know how it's going to go. The second one, she's she gave me like half of last. You know, we do we're like in arrears though. She's <laughs> it's like written the family or something. I'm always trying to play catch up with her. So she's she's coming up short. She's definitely crying um, COVID nineteen. But at the same time, you know, maybe she'll get the stimulus. So the trickle down is going to start hitting people. To to your point, and I think in a lot of businesses, it's going to start hitting um, where it's not your customers, but it's your customers' customers that that are affecting you. I think that's going to be an issue. See, in my case, it's a church. And, you know, this church has a mortgage to pay me on the bank. And it's a church. What am I going to say? You know what I mean? I, mean, I don't... I don't. Is it <laughs> local? Worshiping and die? I mean... Is it local? U.S. government has told churches not to assemble. I know. So, but you know what, though? They're tithing still, though. They're still getting their tithes, though. Believe that, because the pastor needs to eat. They might come to you and tell you that they don't want to pay you, but that pastor is getting his, his bread. They're yeah. tithing online through... Cash app. Everybody know brothers and sisters. In the, is it a black church or white church? Uh, white. A white church. Oh, they're tithing for sure. They're, they're just doing it online. Uh, they're getting their bread. They're probably going to pay you. Their pastor's getting... Yeah. Where, what, what community is it? Uh, it's in South Florida. Fort Lauderdale. Or Florida. right outside. You're going to get there. It's hot down there. Though. South, South Florida is a hot area for this, this virus. You're going to get your bread, though. They don't want to lose it. You can tell them this another church... That's thick and well, yeah, I, I hope to be so optimistic. That's what I can say. Yeah. It's tough, but what do you do? I mean, I guess the, the trick with that. Oh, so you're the bank. You don't have a mortgage on it. You're just, you own it outright. That's your kind of annuity. Yeah. yeah. So there's nobody for you to turn over and say, hey. Not really. Yeah. It's just you. That's tough. Well, Broward County Sheriff and victim <laughs> something. I don't know. It'll be ugly. It's tough, man. But it's, you know, at some point, you they see, I think all state insurance is returning like I don't want to get this number uh, wrong. Like, like a, a bunch of millions of dollars given back to things. So you, you're starting to see non-traditional uh, people having a heart that normally. So you start wondering what's really going on because 
I'm surprised all states like to not say pay me. I mean, it's insurance, right? So if you just lose your insurance. I think a lot of it's just marketing. Have you noticed like companies like Grubhub are basically telling you, hey, save the restaurants, like it's save the wheels or something? You yeah, know? I think a lot of people don't think like that. But you know, the bottom line is if these restaurants go out and everything goes under, something else will be there. I mean, let's not, let's get it wrong. But the, the restaurants you like, I had a buddy who owns an Italian restaurant in the city. I haven't even been there in over a year, but. You know, he did a pickup at a local mall. We all came and we did it. and It was very slow and took a long time. But you know what? I'd do it again just because I don't want to see people go out of business, man. I, you know, I have. That's the case. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I know your your average citizen may live check to check. But if you're in a business that's been around for 10, 15, 20 plus years and you can't survive one bad month. You know, I know, um, like take the NCAA tournament, a lot of sports bars took a hit because, you know, they ramped up getting ready for the NCAA tournament. Mm-hmm. And because it was, you know, canceled, boom, you know, that seasonal income that they depended on took a big hit. But come on now. I mean, do we have to market, like, save the restaurants? I mean, yeah, we're talking about mom and pops, I understand, but franchises? Well, coming you know, from coming from Grubhub, I can see where it seems disingenuous. You're like, yeah, save the restaurants and order through Grubhub because they're making more bread now than they've ever made. You know what I mean? Right. But that just seems like marketing. It is. I mean, we do what you got to do to survive, right? You know, we're trying to get some stuff. Part of the reason why we go to the restaurants is just for, since we can't go out, just the sanity of it. You know what I mean? Not to keep eating at home all the time and make food. But we are making a lot more food. I think in general, uh, you know, in general, this has kind of been a positive. I know my family, I feel like our family's closer together now. Um, it's, it seems kind of goofy and cliche, but like, you know, we watched, I lost your picture, boss. We lost. Yeah, uh, there you go. All right, you're back. So you know, we watch TV together more than we did. So we'll order some food. My daughter will make food. She'll bake every night. She's baking something. So I, I don't know. The, the, the world will change forever in some ways, and then it'll get back to normal in others. But there's a really weird, deep reset if we sit back and think about kind of what's going on and what's important and how to check it out. You know, just like uh, we did that Zoom the other day. You know, why does it take <laughs> a pandemic to do a zoom with people that we haven't talked to before the pandemic. But the fact is we're all in a state of mind that we're like, man, I would love to talk to my buddies. I'd love to go see him. I didn't have time for him three months ago, but I have time for him today, which I think is, you know, it's, it's love. You know, I've always been a communicator with, with the guys I love. And people I care. In my philosophy, that's why if you ever text me, I'll probably call you back. I'm not a big texter. Yeah. I believe he's the most insincere form of communication and it takes five or ten minutes to talk, call somebody because you never yeah. know. So I'm going to be uh, fatalistic, but you know, nah, it's... man, dude, we, you know, we got we lose people, man. People are dying. People do different things, and you don't want it to be your turn and whatever. And, and and you were too busy to do something. You have to live your life while you're here. And I, you know, I sometimes find myself like, buy a humbug. I don't want to spend money. I don't want to do anything, or whatever. And I do need to be frugal because I have other lives that are more important than my own that I'm responsible for. But, I, man, let's enjoy ourselves. Let's go out. You know what I mean? Thinking about the things that we're going to do when this thing breaks, part of it is I don't want to splurge, but I think how much I can enjoy just saying, hey, oh, gee, man, let's, me and you, let's ride, to, let's ride to Cali. We're going to go check out Oscar. We're going to check out Emmett. We're going to check out Shane Sad, do whatever. It doesn't have to be a trip to Brazil. You know, it could be something different than that. So, um, you know, I don't know. I think it's just we're hitting a reset right now in the world, and it's not It's not U.S. It's not, it's not anyone-centric. It's not – culturally centric it's the world everybody should be kind of reflecting and come out of this thing a little bit different so i don't want to get biblical but you never know what but you never know why the plague came you go in the bible there's all kind of plagues think about where the world is i think that's getting biblical i mean if you look at life historically it's there's always been some period of natural selection mm-hmm. and that's why going back to what dr Grigg said you know i was kind of thinking man millions of my people yeah that's not even one two population the best but it's almost like, I don't know, some weird way of cleansing society, and then it resets itself. Because I think this is going to be our new normal. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And as grim as that prospect is, because, you know, we have family and loved ones that we don't want to be part of this new normal. Or we want to be a part of this new normal. Well, some people are already going in that direction. I mean, before the hand, I got a friend that works, and he says that his, his work meetings are all on Zoom, where you have to, like, look at people. I do conference calls. But, like, when they're committing themselves to doing Zoom meetings for normal calls, he says he doesn't have anyone's phone number. 
If you want to talk to somebody, you can't call them. You send them a Zoom meeting. They're trying to get the personal back and the impersonalness of, of technology. And I think now people are getting used to it, and I think that'll become a little bit of the norm. They'll realize you don't need to have a downtown office space. It costs a lot of money. You know, people can be back around their families. People can go do this. They can go do that. I think, I don't know. I think that, that that's a switch. So but there are other cultures. I, I'm not, you know, I don't get me to lying, but there are other cultures where they only have like a four-day week. Yep. You know what I mean? A lot of people, four-day week. Uh, a lot of the European countries, um, they go on, they, they, they say they go on holiday. They might leave four weeks in a row, nonstop and gone. And they don't, and they're not checking in or calling. They're on holiday. And that's where they go. And, you know, there's say what you want about our country, but, you know, we're stress-filled, obese, heart attack, stroke waiting to happen people. And I think sometimes you, we need to be able to unwind a little bit more periodically to, uh, to kind of just get our mind out there and be with the ones that you love and hang out and, and, and enjoy that. We're just always on the go. So... Definitely a new normal. Hey, I uh, lost your picture. I, I can't see you. Um, you can't see my picture? I can still see it. I don't know what to say. Did you go out when I told you I couldn't see you? Could you see your picture? Well, you went out. Um, and I went all I did was switch cameras. Okay. But remember when I told you I lost your picture? When you looked up, could you still see yourself? See, right now your picture's gone. I should just see the S. I was just going from Skype to Facebook. Okay. Well, that's it for the episode. I think we're going to uh, log off here. I don't know if you have any closing remarks that you'd like to say. Uh, no, just, you know, everybody stay safe and uh, stay close to your family and adhere to the rules. Stay inside. Don't think it's a joke. It's a joke. And get you guys in another couple days. Sounds good, man. Everything... Everything's everything, guys. You know me. I love for everybody. Thanks for listening. Whoever's going to listen, um, you know, we're going to get a lot more content like this. We're going to have special guests. Uh, once we get our production right, OG can do his thing and throw a little music and some sound effects. Right now, we're uh, starting under the COVID-19 uh, restrictions, so we're trying to see what we can get to with production. But this is Big Flow and O Show signing out. Thank you. Thank you.